Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Bangladesh erupts over a 40-year-old story, one that the media are struggling to tell even now. Kazakhstan, where the security services make house calls on news organizations, often to shut them down. British newspapers don't want freelance photographers to work for them in Syria anymore. The risk is far too great. And the Harlem Shake rattles and rolls its way around the world. That's our web video of the week. There's a new dateline in the world of news, Shabag Square, in the heart of Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. For three weeks now, protesters have gathered there over a story that goes back to 1971 and the birth of the country. The demonstrators are demanding harsher prison sentences for those guilty of war crimes during that period. Bangladesh has struggled with polarized politics ever since its creation, and the media there mirror societal divisions. News outlets are on opposite sides of the debate over the war tribunal. The editor of one major newspaper is holed up in his office, refusing to come out for fear of being attacked by demonstrators or arrested by the police. The new media component in this story consists of an opinionated band of bloggers working either side of the political divide. Our starting point this week is Shabog Square and the ghosts of 1971. Bangladesh has a very charged history. Starting with a genocide, there's been a fair amount of media repression. It makes it very difficult to stay neutral. And within this space, however, there are media organizations that have tried to do so. It is dangerous terrain. To the outside world, these protests came out of nowhere. For Bangladeshis, they have been 42 years in the making. During the 1971 War of Liberation from Pakistan, Bangladeshis say more than three million people were killed, a quarter million allegedly raped, with as many as seven million refugees spilling across the Indian border. That war created divisions that persist to this day in politics, religion, and the Bangladeshi media. There is a divide that runs across the entire society, and everybody is affected by that divide. For example, uh, on the one hand, you've got the division between the Awami League and the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, and they will be fighting each other on, with equal force on very big issues and very small issues. Then you've got the divide between the secular identity of the country and an assertive minority of traditionalists who are fighting for the supremacy of religious values in the country. Uh, the media is affected by this divide. Well, the media in Bangladesh was not always very polarized and not always very partisan. There was always a niche uh, market for Islamist papers and a niche market for left-wing papers. But this thing started to change in the 90s. With the restoration of democracy, the whole country got too polarized. And the media community also reflected that split. And the journalist community split into two. And as the uh, numbers of newspaper grew, numbers of private televisions grew, they also reflected that view. And uh, so that today, the media is very much polarized, very much supporting one faction or the other. The principal divide in Bangladesh lies between the Awami League, the governing party which is secular, and the nationalist party which is more conservative and adheres to Islamic principles. The Awami League won power in 2008 after promising to prosecute those accused of war crimes in 1971, when many Bangladeshis collaborated with Pakistani forces fighting against independence. One of them was Abdul Qadir Mullah, a senior member of the Jamaat-e-Islami party, which is allied with the conservative Nationalist Party. He was convicted of rape and the deaths of 344 people. On February 4th, when the War Crimes Tribunal sentenced him to life rather than death, the mass demonstrations began. Most of these newspapers and uh, journalists, they were actually surprised to see that such a huge movement has been waiting to unfold under their nose without them noticing it. So that is really something that they are still trying to come to grips with. And until they find how to really handle that, we are not going to get any thorough uh, analytical approach to what is happening. I think at the moment everybody is trying to either distance themselves from this movement 
or try to connect themselves to. So, I mean, that level of, you know, kind of nuanced, neutral journalism, analytical kind of, you know, questioning is still yet to come. For me, what's interesting isn't so much what Bangladeshi media has or has not done. I think they've done a massive job. International media has escaped it altogether. This amazing movement that's taken place in Bangladesh has hardly been reported at all. One newspaper that has become part of this story is Amar Daesh, a conservative paper aligned with the Nationalist Party and against the Awami League government. It always had a partisan bent, but became more ideologically driven in 2008 when Mahmudur Rahman, a political operative, was given the editor's job. The paper has been critical of the War Crimes Tribunal and the Shabag Square movement. Rahman is the editor who refuses to leave his office, he says, because he fears being arrested or attacked. The paper has become much less of a newspaper and more of a campaigning organ against the Awami League. Amar Desh has been instrumental in propagating uh, one line that the bloggers who organize Shahabad protests are all atheists and they're writing anti-Islam, anti-Muhammad stuff on their blogs. And as a result, these prints have gone around madrasas and mosques and whipped up a lot of sentiment about this uh, anti-Islam atheism that uh, they see is uh, coming from Shahabag. So the anti-Shahabag movement got a kind of a lift with this uh, atheism, anti-Islam line, which they think that Ahmad Desh has been instrumental in uh, propagating. The really editor of this newspaper, Mahmoud Rahman, I mean, he is just the kind of person who, you know, likes to talk about issues that other people don't talk about. And he, in the past, uh, because he was speaking about, you know, corruption in the country, which is, again, a taboo for many journalists, he was detained and he was tortured. So he, he is that sort of a person. And sometimes he just goes further in order to push the barriers of what he considers to be freedom of expression. According to the government, journalists like Mahmudur Rahman are going too far. The country's information minister said many of the owners and journalists of these dailies were instigators of genocide committed during the Liberation War in 1971. And he said the government is considering taking legal action. The war crimes trials and the Shabag Square protests have added up to a tumultuous time in Bangladesh. This is a country just four years removed from a caretaker, military-backed government. The kinds of debates being conducted in the media today, however extreme some of the positions may be, are welcomed by those who remember the way things used to be. Bangladeshi media has done remarkably well, given that every government has been suppressive, repressive. I think the media has been quite resilient, particularly when we had a military-backed government. The media had very, very little freedom. I think in relative terms, it's beginning to expand, it's beginning to take on a more responsible role. It's about time the government also recognized that the media had a role to play and it must be allowed to play that role. Our Global Village Voices now on the coverage of the story in Bangladesh. Every media outlet is identified by their political leanings and they act as a mouthpiece for the chosen party. This means that accurate information is actually really difficult to obtain. Most current private newspapers, channels, including state TV, are owned and run by pro-regime people. Bangladesh politics have huge impact on countries' media. The government, they are using the media as a tool to serve their own purpose. The media, they can play a role to resolve the present political conflict. But unfortunately, due to the impact of Bangladesh politics on media, they are simply spreading hatred, producing one-sided news, accusing a party of fundamentalism and extremism. Online media has played a very positive role regarding both the ICT and the Shambhak protests. We have been making constant use of Twitter to let the world know what's happening at Shahbag Round the Clock and what this movement stands for. Nonetheless, I would like to still take the opportunity to appeal to the Western media to grant the coverage that a movement like Shahbag deserves. We're always on the lookout for new faces for the program. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the news media as one of our Global Village voices, just get in touch with us on Facebook or send us a tweet. Our Twitter handle is at AJ Listening Post. And don't forget, our free video podcast, it's on iTunes. Just go looking for the Listening Post, Al Jazeera English, 
and you'll find us there. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. The name of French photographer Olivier Voisin is the latest to be added to the list of journalists killed in Syria. The French Foreign Ministry announced February 24th that Voisin died while undergoing treatment in Turkey for shrapnel wounds he sustained while covering the war in the province of Idlib. Voisin's death came just days after The Guardian, The Times and several other British newspapers revealed that they are no longer accepting unsolicited photographs from freelancers working in Syria. The risks to the photographers, they say, are just too great. Reporters Without Borders puts the total number of journalists killed in Syria at 23. That's not including another 55 citizen journalists who have lost their lives since the uprising began nearly two years ago. There's still no word from the authorities in Israel on the detention of Mohammed Sabane, a Palestinian cartoonist arrested February 16th. Sabane's wife says he was on his way back from Jordan to his home on the West Bank when Sabane called her saying he'd been arrested. The next day, she says she was told that he was being held at the Jalame Detention Center north of Tel Aviv. An article in the Palestinian newspaper where Sabane's cartoons are published, Al Hayat Al Jadida, said that he is under investigation for providing services to, quote, hostile organizations, unquote, although the identity of those organizations remains unknown. His friends say that Sabane has not been able to contact his family since being arrested. He's had no access to a lawyer, and the Israelis have yet to formally charge him. The speculation is that Sabane has been singled out for his satirical drawings that depict the Israeli occupation, as well as the conditions under which Palestinian prisoners are held in Israeli jails. A poet from the Gulf state of Qatar who was previously sentenced to life imprisonment has had that sentence reduced, but he still faces 15 years in jail. Last November, a court ruled that poems by Muhammad Rashid al-Ajami, who writes under the pen name Muhammad ibn al-Dib, were insulting to Qatar's emir and an incitement to overthrow the government. In Qatar, that's an offense that carries a life sentence. Al-Ajami has never denied that he wrote the poem, entitled Tunisian Jasmine, that criticizes governments across the Gulf for ignoring calls for reform after the Arab Spring. A recital of that poem was uploaded onto YouTube. Cutting Al-Ajami's sentence to 15 years did not impress the Twitter sphere. Bayan, a Gulf politics specialist based in Paris, tweeted, hope they aren't expecting a bravo for this. And a Dubai-based blogger asked Qatar's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs how it hosts Al Jazeera, champions freedom of speech, and still jailed a poet. The story has a way to go, apparently. After the appeal court reduced the sentence, Qatar's attorney general said he would prefer the life term reinstated, while Al Ajami's lawyers say they're confident that the poet will eventually be pardoned. We'll keep you posted. In economic terms, the Central Asian country of Kazakhstan is far better off than its ex-Soviet neighbors. It's rich with abundant oil and natural resources. And the government, led by President Nursultan Nazarbayev, knows how it wants the country to be perceived as a fast developing nation with a bright future. The other side of the story, not told on state-owned television, is a repressive political system, a poor human rights record, and a crackdown on the media that is intensifying. The news outlets targeted by the government had key roles in covering the 2011 demonstrations involving oil workers in the western city of Zhenauzen. Since those riots, many private media outlets have become identified with opposition figures who the government contends are enemies of the state. Al Jazeera correspondent Robin Forrest J. Walker now from Almaty on the battle over the media space in Kazakhstan. In Kazakhstan, raids on news outlets are a common occurrence. A day before the February raid on Respublican newspaper's office in the city of Almaty, I got a tip off. So what are we going to film them coming in? So our cameras were rolling when the security services knocked. Respublica was shut down by the government on charges of extremism back in December 2012. The paper, however, has continued publishing. The paper's name was changed. The masthead now reads Republic, and its weekly print run is under 100 copies. The rest of the news operation is online. Respublica isn't the only news outlet that's circumventing a government ban using legal loopholes and an internet connection. The government issued a ban on two newspapers, Respublica and Vizglad, the TV station K+, and many websites, about 40 media outlets in total. 
If it weren't for the internet and the availability of software that we can use to overcome state blockades, we'd be behind the Iron Curtain like in Soviet times. There are very few independent media left in Kazakhstan. And the journalists who work for this media are under constant pressure from the government. The entire might of the government machine is used to complicate journalists' lives. Court cases, personal threats and beatings. All that has become the everyday reality of being a journalist in Kazakhstan. Lina Zdanova is one of the founders of the Stan TV production company. The organization has been in the government's crosshairs ever since 2011, when riots exploded in the western city of Zhenaozen. Stan TV was all over the story. The production company fed footage of government forces cracking down on protesting oil workers to channels broadcasting into Kazakhstan like K+. And from there, the video went around the world. So what people saw, if they were watching, Stan TV or K+, they were seeing user-uploaded content of those clashes, and they were seeing people being taken to the hospital. They were seeing fights between police and workers, which is exactly what the government doesn't want to have shown. The events in Jano Zen really blew up the government of Kazakhstan's whole narrative about what Kazakhstan has been doing for 20 years. And so the outlets that made that information available, those were the ones that were hit the hardest. The intimidation we'd experienced before was nothing in comparison to what happened after Zhenaozen. There were direct threats against our staff. Secret service officers would come up directly to our employees and threaten them and their family members. They would call in the middle of the night and come to people's homes. Their strategy was first to imprison opposition uh, politicians who were supporting uh, strikers, and then to connect opposition media to opposition party who supported strikers and to close them down for political extremism. Since Kazakhstan gained independence from the Soviet Union 22 years ago, it's had one president, Nursultan Nazarbayev. In 2010, he was formally named leader of the nation by an act of parliament. A year later, in the 2011 elections, the Kazakh Electoral Commission announced that the president had been re-elected with a percentage evocative of Soviet-era elections, 95.5%. According to the Nazarbayev government, there are almost 3,000 media outlets in Kazakhstan. It says it controls only 16% of them. But in reality, the other 84% are largely owned by groups or individuals affiliated to the regime. So, for instance, KTK, one of the main commercial channels, is owned by Dariga Nazarbayeva, the president's daughter. It's a restrictive media environment here, and defamation is still a criminal offence. For the Kazakh opposition, privately owned media outlets represent the last recourse. The government's stated justification for closing down news outlets is that they're funded by forces hostile to the government. The media outlets themselves deny that. However, the name of one man keeps coming up. Former Kazakh energy minister turned Nazarbayev nemesis Mukhtar Abliazov. Abliazov was living in exile in the United Kingdom but fled the country last year when a judge there sentenced him to prison for contempt of court and for lying about his personal wealth. A spokesman for the Kazakh government wrote to us saying, The action taken against outlets such as Stan TV and other affiliated media entities came only after clear evidence emerged that they had a role to play in the tragic events in Zhenaozen. All outlets in question were funded and controlled by Mokhtar Abliazo. I don't believe any country would allow an international fugitive to fund information attacks and use media resources to spread lies and call for violence. The government sees Abliazov as a direct threat to them. And even some of them probably see him as the main threat against the government of Kazakhstan. And so the affiliation of these outlets with Abliazov is what the government has been cracking down on. Tune into the state news channel Khabar 
and it becomes clear not just how the Nazarbayev government sees itself, but also how it wants to be portrayed. We have a massive pool of journalists in the service of the state, and their job is to describe the activities of our government officials. The channel has wide reach and is watched by many. There's a joke from the Soviet times. When people watch Kabar, they say, I want to live in this wonderful country where everything is so nice. We live in, not in Kazakhstan, but in Wonderland. If you watch Khabar, everything's perfect. Nazarbayev goes around the country, opens schools, helps farmers. Our economy is growing. Everyone has jobs. Perfect, perfect country. But the impressions created on Khabar and the photo opportunities featuring the leader of the nation don't come close to telling the whole story. Kazakhstan hasn't used its wealth to develop institutions. And the media is a key part of this. It's, it's very difficult to resolve people's grievances if you won't allow those grievances to be voiced in public, which is what a free media does. It finds problems, it examines them, and it brings them to the attention of society. And right now, the government of Kazakhstan is discouraging that from happening, and it's going to cripple the country's development. I hope we will be able to continue our media work. But the situation is complicated, and I'm not too optimistic. I just watched this movie, Life of Pi, a story about a boy who survives a shipwreck and is stuck on a lifeboat with a tiger. Somehow, the story of Pi reminded me of our situation. We are in a similar ocean of problems, trying to survive. And maybe our secret services play the role of the tiger. It keeps us alert and stops us from giving up and sinking to the bottom. As long as we are resisting, we are alive. More Global Village voices now on the state of journalism in Kazakhstan. Private media have been increasingly characterized as opposition by the government or shut down for their reporting. It seems that in the short term, the government is likely to continue cracking down. And in the long term, it seems that the government has always found it advantageous to allow some amount of free expression in order to improve its image in, to the outside world. And people have come to expect it, so I am optimistic that things will get better, but simply not soon. There is an attempt to control uh, the internet and to regulate the virtual space uh, by Kazakh government. Uh, recently, Marat Tajrin, uh, the Secretary of State of Kazakhstan, gave a task to create a list of a famous bloggers and famous uh, social networking sites users. It is still unclear uh, what is the purpose of that list. Uh, is it about uh, incentives or is it about further control and further regulation of the internet? Finally, there was no avoiding this, although we did try. The latest viral dance craze is the Harlem Shake. It started about a month ago when five teenagers from Queensland in Australia uploaded a video of themselves dancing to a song by a Brooklyn-based Latino music producer called Bauer. The video went crazy, 400 million views and more than 100,000 copycats, including skydivers, underwater stormtroopers, newscasters, Norwegian army cadets, and Chinese grandmothers. This meme has also managed to offend. In Egypt, four people were arrested for doing the dance in their underwear. In Tunisia, students are protesting their right to shake after the authorities threatened some kind of crackdown. Our web video of the week is a Harlem Shake global remix. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. That is one of possibly the strangest video trends to sweep the web. That's not the shake, me? Oh, no good. You gotta be really on beat when you're doing this. Harlem, 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 Harlem on my mind. Mm.